whoever is doing the uh, recording. There we go. Um, well, hi, everybody. Uh, we are almost at the end. We are going to do uh, today's um, 10 C's for teamwork, and there's a whole lot of jokes involved in this. And um, then uh, next week actually is going to be our last one. Since I had to expand one of them to cover two weeks, I flipped that backwards, and I took the last two and shoved them together. So uh, you've only got one more meeting to go. And then I think we're going to print up some happy-go-lucky things and uh, put all the videos together, and we're just going to give out a nice package uh, to anybody um, that has uh, put themselves through this 12-week progress um, process. It was uh, a lot of stuff to go over, I know. Um, let's talk about... Uh, I think we're going to start on the lecture first. We'll do the optional reading at the end because there's really only one thing I want to get out of um, that book that I think will have impact. Um, Ten C's for Teamwork. Um, copyright uh, 2078 by Dumb Ideas Incorporated. A registered division of Trendy Fluff. A wholly owned division of Wonder If They'll Buy This Nonsense. It is um, an interesting concept when you start putting together top six, top eight, top ten lists. Um, just because you can use the same letter to describe them. There, there's a bunch of these things. They're all made by little marketing people in tiny cramped cubicles and generally trend writers. Um, often they have limited value uh, other than it uh, allows them to sell advertising space. I'm not a big fan, can you tell? Um, your mileage may vary. Some are similarly required. Check with your doctor if uh, overhyped trends are for you. Um, not available in all states. So, Everybody loves top ten lists. I don't know why. Um, for some reason, we think if we use uh, double digits to go up to ten, um, everything's awesome, and everybody loves a list where everything can be linked together by something like the letter. Um, is it really? Maybe it's just hip. It's just trendy. Is there ever anything good? Sometimes, um, but not often. And there's so much um, that is of limited value that if you're like me and you're always reading and looking on websites and stuff you find that there's so much flotsam and jetsam um, out there that you, you don't really get a lot of good stuff. Um, you, you waste your time reading. It's uh, kind of like the management bestsellers we always talk about. And um, the reason some of the books that I, I talk about here is because they've stood the test of time. You know, There's other really good ones um, that didn't. Uh, Zap. I read Zap. Is D-Z-E-A-P, I think it was? Or Z-A-P-P, -P, I can't remember, but Zap many years ago. And uh, I loved it. Uh, didn't really stand the test of time. Picked up one or two good things out of it. That's uh, generally what you do. And even when you go through the top ten list, um, that's kind of what happens. But what I wanted to do was give you a trendy, cool, um, marketing buzzy sort of top ten list, but make it one you could actually use. So uh, you, too, can feel like you have a silly trend. So if you want all those things, congratulations, we have it all today. All right. So high-performing teams are high-communication teams. High-performing teams uh, that are high-communication teams have several things in common. Um, they foster communication. They reward communication. They work through communication. Um, let's put all this high-performing communication and all the rest of these things together in one list and uh, have fun with it. But let's be very clear before I do, real leadership is not trendy. Um, it rarely is. It's an honest appraisal of your strengths and weaknesses against your team's capability and needs. And it's it's having the the strength or the will um, to improve yourself and to improve your team at the same time. That's really it. I mean there's no there's there's no cool buzzword. It's not easy, it's not fast. There's no slogan you can use for it. Uh, sometimes you have to make the right decision. Other times you have to make the decision right. Um, nonsense like that sounds interesting on Dr. Phil, um, but but it simply isn't the case in real life. So here's the rule. Leadership, completely boiled down to everything, is clarity and will. There really are no shortcuts. It's clarity in that you know your weaknesses and you know your strengths. You know your team's weaknesses. You know your team's strengths. And having the will to improve yourself and improve the team for their sake. I can't say that strong enough, for their sake. Uh, making things better for everybody. If you're doing it for you, 
So you can be cool because you want a high performing team because you would like to get a promotion. Quit now. Um, because that's not sincere. It's not real. Are you really demonstrating clarity or are you demonstrating ambition? Um, if you're going to be a great leader and, and I'm not there, I work at it. We all work at it. No one I know is there. I've known a couple of people that were close. Um, and I try to emulate them whenever I can, but clarity will. That's leadership. Um, so you're going to see hundreds of catchy lists. You're going to see hundreds of cool websites. You're going to see lots of books that all claim it's this. You know, the, the six C's that matter, the eight C's of communication, the four C's that will change your team, you know, the mm, whatever it is. Um, but like I said, we're going to make our own. All right. Not quite trendy, um, but real. All right. So I made a list of 10 and I use C's on every one of them just because. But um, I think in reality, it uh, turned out to be kind of a handy checklist. Uh, I don't think it'll ever sell uh, or ever become trendy per se because there's too much work involved in each one of them. And the one thing you should have learned by now from all those management books is there's not a lot of work in most of them uh, because what they're trying to do is sell a book. That's the end of the day. That's all they're doing. Uh, we're not trying to sell a book. We're trying to make things a little easier. So the ones that I'm going to write down up here require more effort on your part. All right. So let's get started. I have this printed. It's a big list. Are we ready? All right. Number one. I've said it already, but I'm going to say it again. Clarity. This is not necessarily just your clarity. It's the clarity that you pass on to the team. So it's, it's the expectations of the team as a whole. It's the shared values of the team. It's basically everybody on the team and everybody in the team seeing and viewing the same way. You know, and you have to ask yourself at some point, does every person on your team get it? Are they all seen it the same way? And if you have somebody that isn't quite rising to the standards of the rest of the team, before you start chewing on that person, before you start trying to fix, solve anything else, the first question, there's a reason it's number one, is you've got to ask yourself, clarity, have I ensured that they see this the way the rest of us do? Because if you haven't, quite frankly, you can't be angry at them. You can't be upset at them. You can't try to correct. I'll talk about the word criticize later, but you can't try to correct it. Um, because, quite frankly, the fault was yours. You, as a leader, own clarity on the team. No one else. Absolutely no one else. So if someone else doesn't have it, you have to recognize that you missed it, and you need to fix it. After that, if you can't, well, you know my routine, up or out, right? But clarity is something you own. All right? Two, some people think it's the same thing, but it isn't. Context. Not in how it looks. Context in this regard is more, does everybody know why me? Does each person on your team know why me? Are they a good fit? Is the job a good fit? Is it a fit in terms of skill? Is it a fit in terms of aspiration? Is it where they want to be or is it a lateral step for them to get somewhere else? Um, they need to have context that what they're doing matches where they want to go. Um, third one, commitment. I love this one. Because this one is always misunderstood. Remember, you're trying to build. We, we stated at the outset a high-performing team, right? Um, you don't just want to run a group. You don't really need a lot of commitment to run a group. But if you're trying to have a high-performing team, you have to have commitment which is to say you cannot force participation in a high-performing team. I want to say that again. I want you to hear this. You cannot force high-performing teams on B players. You can't take a B or a C and make them live up to an A. You can't do it. Um, a high-performing team, for someone to be a part of it and to be successful, they have to be completely bought into it and want to participate. Listen, the, most of the people that are going to be in any of your organizations are, are going to be B players. Um, some groups have more Cs. 
Um, IT generally doesn't uh, put up with skis for very long. Uh, IT is a high performance culture. So everybody, mostly, is going to be B's and C's, and you're going to have a little more A's than B's. Um, then, then not, not more A's and B's, we're going to have more A's and B's um, than normal in some other industries. Is what it is. Um, if you go to, you know, industries that don't have a lot of internal pressure to improve, and this would include some uh, learning institutions that would certainly improve the government, civil service, you can have a lot of B's and C's and very few A's. And in fact, the C's will outnumber the B's guaranteed. Um, not the case here. But to take someone who isn't wanting to put in that extra effort and force them into a team of A's, um, you know, you're actually setting them up to fail. You're not doing them a favor. You're not doing yourself a favor. It requires commitment. You have to have people that want to do more. The kind of people that will get up every single Friday when they've got other things to do to close out their their uh, week and do things like what we're doing today. This is commitment. Every single person doing this has basically raised their hand and said, I want to be better. That's what you need if you're going to have A's. Um, number four, competence. You'd think they'd be higher, but it ain't. I'm not talking about the competence of your team members. I'm not talking about their skills. How about yours? The team members, if they don't have the skills they need, that's your job to do it. You're supposed to fix that, right? You're supposed to train. That's one of the things we do. We train. You can never be upset at someone for not having the skills. Your job is to either hire for them or to build them. The competence we're talking about here is if you're going to have a high-performing team, you have to demonstrate that you're capable of leading. If it's a new position, a new company, new job, whatever the case may be, um, you don't necessarily have the ability to demonstrate it out of the gate, but there is this wonderful little probationary period people give you, probably less time than you think, uh, but more time than you're afraid. Uh, you you have a matter of anywhere from, you know, two, three months uh, to get your feet under you, learn, ingratiate yourself into the culture, into the lives of your people, and then start to show your confidence. You do. And you don't have to know everything out of the gate. You just have to have clarity, will, and then you can demonstrate it. But I assure you, if you're going to have a high-performing team and you don't have skills, you're forever that, what was that, uh, let me get a cup here. <sighs> yeah, I'm going to need you to come in on Saturday. That'd be great, thanks. Uh, you're just that, that caricature from office space. So you have to be able to demonstrate competence. If you don't have it, you better get it quick. All right, moving right along, next one is charter. Charter is simply making sure, I'm sorry, I'm sitting back and down, up and down. My legs are really tired. I come through last night um, at my house. I'm trying to get ready for Saturday, and I shouldn't have done that. Uh, anyway, competence is uh, you. Charter is everyone else. Charter is essentially where do other organizations and other leadership buy in with your capabilities and you and your team's understanding of roles. Uh, where we used to use the term, I think, in PMI, uh, you know, your, your primary stakeholders and having agreements with them, having charter with them. If you are going to run a high-performing team, you have to have impact. Here it comes. The only way to have impact it's if you have buy-in with the rest of the organization. If everybody else isn't on board that A, B, and C is your job, and you can do D, E, and F because it's completely within your purview, you're not going to be allowed to, which means you're not really going to be a high-performing team. You're going to be a high-stress team. Think that through. Um, so charter is very uh, is very very important. Control is often it's understood as charter. Charter is literally buy-in from the rest of the organization that you can. Um, control is the details. Think of it as span of control, right? I am a firm believer, and I'm sure quite a few of you have heard me say this before, um, that if you're really going to have an impact, you, you have to have three things. You have to have responsibility, accountability, and authority. 
with those three, I guess I should do this, my hand's tired. With those three, you can do almost anything. With two of the three, you can be a caretaker, but you're never going to make change. Uh, with one of the three, you're doomed to fail, and you probably shouldn't be in that organization role or job function. Um, think it through. If you have a responsibility for something, that very much aligns with charter. But, you know, we've got, um, think of a, a technical account manager. A technical account manager is a very difficult job. Um, the people that do that for us on this team are rock stars to me because, by definition, the job only has two of the three, right? So they got the responsibility and they have the accountability to keep the client happy, but they don't have the authority to do it. The job function is only two of three. So what they have to do is work on relationships, relationships with their clients, and relationships with me and the rest of the stakeholders in the company so that we will loan them our authority. They don't have it internally. They don't have it themselves. Lee Evans can't say, we're going to change the hoops. We're going to do this. We're going to use this technology. He doesn't have that authority. He has to use mine. He has to borrow mine. He has to work on a relationship with me. I think I'm picking on Lee. I'm not trying to. Um, the perfect job to have an impact is where you have all three. I, for example, have all three. Got the responsibility for IT. I've certainly got the accountability. Oh, yes, I do. <laughs> That's not a lot of fun. Uh, but I also have the authority. I can hire, I can fire, I can train, I can change, I can switch platforms. Now, I'm not going to do any of that without my team. I'm not going to do any of that without your buy-in. I'm not going to do any of that with, you know, without really making sure everybody sees it, we've looked at it, we've reviewed it, blah, 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 blah. But that's just because I'm careful. I have all those three. Now, some companies I've been at, there's been people that had all those three and they've wrecked it. You know, so you still, you still have to take all these things into account, but to have a major impact, to be really high performing, you need those three things. You can't lose one. In the case of a technical account manager, they borrow mine through relationship building, but that's because they need it. You really need these three. All right? So that's your span of control. Seven, collaboration. My hand is so terrible. It's awesome. You think I'm talking about getting along, but I don't. Um, what I'm really talking about is how do the members of your team work together? This is kind of a big deal. I made a couple of notes. I'm going to read them here. You know, because I'm talking about how do your team members interact with each other day to day as they do their job, right? So what are the roles? What are the responsibilities? Who gets credit for what? And the big one, how are decisions made? Now, you think this through. This simple concept of ensuring everyone on the team understands that the uh, the group's function works A, B, and C, probably the thing most often missed when you're building a high-performing team. How decisions are made. When I got here, I had people literally say, you can't make a decision without making sure I agree with you. These were guys that reported to people that reported to me. I'm sorry, what? You know, that's pretty sure that's my name on the door. Um, well, that's not how it works. This this person uh, had read a book recently about uh, servant leadership. That isn't what it talks about. I've had other people say, well, you have to pull your direct report. No, I really don't. I do. That's not the same thing as have to. How are decisions made in my organization? Um, I take feedback from my teams. Um, they tell me exactly what they think. At the end of the day, I make a decision because I also have to listen to Jed Carlson in the corner and all the rest of the executives here. i got to compare and contrast that against our long-term strategic plan, and then I can compare and contrast that against the interest of our shareholders and what they say at the board meetings. It's actually all quite convoluted. Um, that's really how my decision-making process works. Now, if you move down a couple of steps into more focused roles, uh, it can be completely different. Uh, we have uh, some people in the uh, database arena, some people in the systems arena, some people in this, and each one of these groups make decisions different way. Um, if you make a change, for example, on our network without uh, Mike Ely's view of it, there's going to be a problem because, or not just Mike, but one of the other guys, they always use two. Two people view every change. If you're going to make an emergency change in the middle of the day, I need to be spoken to. Because I've got to be sure that 
whatever they're doing isn't going to risk Amazon launching that, right? That sort of thing. Um, but all these details about how decisions are made are known and laid out up front. It took a while. Um, it always does. Um, but we've worked it out. Well, at this point, do we even think about it anymore? I mean, there's no conversation. But if you walk up and you run a team and you get 10 people together, really strong, smart individuals, and the more high-powered they are, the more troublesome it is. We're going to do this, and we're going to go achieve that. And you don't lay the ground rules. Okay, Jane, you make decisions on this. Tim, you talk to our shareholders. Tim, you know, on and on and on. If you're not laying all that out, oh, oof, there it goes again. If you don't lay all that out, you're just setting your team up for unnecessary drama. And if you're trying to be a high-performing team, do you really have time for that? I don't think so. On the point of shareholders... Let's talk about number eight, communication. The single most ignored thing in any really good team, constantly. It's kind of one of those things that everybody assumes is handled, but you need to be specific about it. And so when I talk about communications, I'm talking about internal and external, and it will radically change how your team is viewed, right? So internal, who should be saying what? in A, B, or C event, right? In the event of an outage, who sends that notification? In the event of a go live, who's talking about it? Um, external, who is the person told? Are you telling this person about A and that other person about B and this other person about C, or is it these two people whenever C happens, blah, blah, blah? Um, it matters. If you have a high-performing team, Generally, most people will have um, mentors or stakeholders or people with some interest in their life. If communication is only supposed to go out to this one particular group because you're dealing with an outage, but one person on the team also tells the VP of so-and-so because they hang out every day and eat pie, they're going to have unnecessary drama. How did that get out? Why would that talk to them? This was an internal-only discussion. You have to state these things up front. Um, that's why my leadership team meeting, I'm very prone to say, and I repeat it very often, um, my leadership team meeting is Vegas. What has happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. What is said in my meeting stays in my meeting. Because what I talk to, you know, Jamie Dean about, Kevin Ahern about, Art Burt, Jamie Vernon, are things that might happen. In general, they're not even supposed to share those down. They're just supposed to know what might happen so they can set up plans for it just in case. And so that if it comes to pass, they aren't caught flat-footed. They already knew it could come. And they're basically prepared to discuss it with you guys. And they've already got a rough idea of how we need to handle it. Um, but that communication strategy, who says what and to who, was set ahead of time. It stops a lot of pain. I never have a concern that something I say is going to go to the wrong person. I don't want the vice president of so-and-so, a particular client, to have a heart attack because I said I'm going to spend more time on this thing this quarter. And you'd be surprised how absolutely sensitive people can get to things like that, especially in environments, as today's modern business world certainly is, where resources are finite and you're doing a balancing act on a regular basis. So communication, big deal. All right? Number nine, the scariest word in this, Consequence. You know, I'm a big believer in balanced management. We've talked about that before and how you have to have balanced consequences and you need transparency all of the above. All I'm really saying here is if you're going to have a really high performing team, which is a lot like driving a McLaren, it's a lot like driving a Lamborghini, little adjustment. You make a big turn, you're going to wreck. You've got really high-performing people. Adjustments is all that required because you're going very, very fast. Um, consequence is a big deal. And all I'm really saying is that they should know them up front. If you've got a charter to change the universe because you're going to try to double your uptime, which we did, by the way, as a team, all of us did. Not too shabby, guys. If you've got a charter like that, what happens if you do? Uh, well, in our case, we sort of got to take over our own fate and do our own planning. And we knew that up front. When when I came in 
we had very, very strict guidelines. I think several of us on this meeting had conversations about, well, why are we making this decision? How come nobody talked about that? Came down from above. They had zero faith in IT, not because of you guys, but because there were some problems with previous leadership. So, and I'm not even throwing rocks at those people. I think it was just a quote, bad fit. Um, every job has to have that perfect fit. Remember, we've talked about that several times. So there wasn't a lot of flexibility in what IT could do. Uh, my statement back to Chad and company is give me this and this, and I'll give you that. What were the consequences of it? Well, if I give you that, then you need to give me the room to make these decisions in the future and to decide this and that and the other. I had that consequence set up in advance, positive and negative. Because for the record, kids, if we hadn't pulled it off, the consequence was I was unemployed. That'd have been okay. I'd have been somewhere else. But that was an absolute consequence known when I walked in. Um, I had to walk down and sit in my office and say, Wayne, I hate to say this, but, you know, I mean, it was win or go home. So I had my positive consequence and I had my negative consequence set up in advance. On our team, we've done the same thing. So now we have the ability to make these decisions and do what we feel is in the best interest of our shareholders. Each of the people in my organization, within certain boundaries, now has more freedom to do things. I give hints, you know, create leaders, do this, do that, do the other. But they now have this freedom, and they also have a better working relationship between them. As a consequence, they're more empowered, you know. When you're building a high-performance team, be very upfront. Don't threaten. You're not saying, do this or you're out, you know, even if that's the reality. But simply just passionately lay out, here's what can happen if we don't pull this off. Here's what can happen if we do. Um, don't make promises you can't keep. And if we achieve this, I get to give everybody a 20% raise. Mm, no, don't, don't make promises you don't have control over. That's another thing that happened here before. And... I had several very unhappy people in the organization when I showed up waiting for these promises to be fulfilled. Um, you just simply lay out within your span of control what the negative and what the positives are, and then you let your high-performing team of rock stars get you there and you help subtly along the way. Um, last but not least at all is Ken, my favorite one. Coordinating. It was hard to find a seat for this, just so you know. Um, but unlike the management uh, trend goobers, I didn't want to dial it in. Coordinated. That means you. You coordinate regular meetings, email summary, stakeholder conversations, resource acquisitions. You got to stay involved. You know, uh, a ship at sea may have a wonderful helmsman and an amazing crew, but if the captain stays in his uh, in, in his quarters, it never gets anywhere. You're constantly making little course coordination. You're you're constantly making little changes. You have to. You have to. So I'm going to give you a rule, and I want you guys to remember this forever, uh, because it's actually kind of a big deal to me. You cannot be an absent leader. Those two words are mutually exclusive. You can't be. You have to be involved. So even though you've got rock stars, even though the adjustments you're making are subtle because you've got a high-performing team of folks that really know their jobs, Kevin Ahern, I'm going to pick on you, Kevin, does not need me to tell him how to do an ETL or, or how a metric needs to be created. He doesn't need it. Now, I'm a firm believer that, you know, four eyes are better than two. I certainly try to stay involved where I think it can add value, but does he need me to teach him how to do BI? No. I have a BI background. I could walk around stating my opinion all the time, but he doesn't need this. He just needs to be sure that he's on the same page with everybody else and that we're all going the right direction for our shareholders. And that's my purview. Top down the group. Um, but I can't just assume that because he's awesome, and he is, Kevin's a rock star. I can't assume because he's awesome that I can't show up. 
that I can't reach out, that I can't talk. Eh, it'll be fine. I got news for you. You ever go, eh, it'll be fine. Eh, you're unemployed because your team's going to fail. There is no such thing as absent leadership. All right? Now, that's your full list of C's. Um, don't you feel special now that you have a trendy list too? I think you should. Um, we're going to talk real quickly about uh, the uh, book, which was uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. Um, I'm actually not going to spend a lot of time in the book. I've done it different ways um, over the times I've discussed it over the last, you know, I guess I've probably discussed that book 20 years, 15, 20, something like that. I've gone through all the lists, six ways to pe make people like you, 12 ways to get people around to your way of thinking, nine ways to change people without arousing resentment, and all of those things. And um, none of them really necessary. They really aren't. We talked through most of them just with different terms. Um, what I want to focus on is the word criticize. Right? If you were to really go through that book, really spend time with it, it actually lines up very well with leadership and self-deception in one regard. It lines up very well with our conversations on empathy and clarity and knowing what's going on in your organization. And the one thing they point to is criticism and how really painful that can be and what a negative influence it is. I'm not talking about constructive criticism because constructive criticism isn't, that's coaching, it's coaching. Uh, but I'm talking about genuine criticism. Could you screw that up more? Did you really mean to do that? What were you thinking? Um, what made you decide to do that? That's simple sentence. What made you decide to do that? Um, is a, a caustic thing for you to throw out. And to be honest with you, Carnegie does a really wonderful job about explaining why that is. Um, let me give you a couple of examples. And, um, let's state at the front this one simple thing. No one, I should probably say virtually, I'm dealing with IT people. I need to be careful here. Um, virtually, no one believes criticism of themselves is justified. I would say ever, but again, I'm dealing with IT people, let me not put you a, a, a universal here. Virtually, no one thinks criticism is justified. And that's anybody, anywhere, in any function or capacity. No matter what you say, I can't believe you missed that. You completely screwed this up. You did this, you did that, you did the other. An immediate series of justifications goes through their mind. Well, I'm the only one doing this. Well, the other guy is on vacation. Well, I was up all night working on this for you. This, this self-justification is immediate. We talked about that little voice in the back of your head before. Um, that voice, more than anything, pushes back against criticism. And what's fascinating about this is this is in everybody and in everything. Al Capone was a murderous, murderous person. He personally killed God knows how many people. There's some pretty wildly disparate numbers there, uh, depending upon who you believe. Um, but if you think about the people he ordered killed, um, the number is painfully high more so than uh, most bad guys today, and that was in a simpler time. Um, you know, when he was finally nailed, he, in this book, he talks about, he didn't show remorse. You know, his justification for being a murderous, you know, drug runner and booze runner and all the rest of the things he did at the time um, was that he was just trying to make people's lives lighter. He was trying to make their lives easier. Why was all this happening to him? He had completely self-justified shooting people while he did things. That's fascinating. Um, you can look through some of the greatest, uh, I should say most infamous, not greatest, some of the most infamous bad guys of our time, up to and including mass murderers, and every single one of them goes, I didn't have a choice. Pull this down into regular folks, and you know, let's leave the extraordinarily psychotic behind. And um, you see the same thing. You can't criticize and be heard. The minute you criticize, you are blocked off. They're in the world of justification at that moment, and you've got nothing but resentment out of doing it. Coaching is not criticism. Coaching is an open help for someone. There's a wonderful story in there. I can't remember 
the uh, president. Someone's going to remember it and send me a note later that I do remember my own books. But um, about uh, uh, someone who got into an airplane and the wrong kind of fuel had been put into it. And he lands and barely, barely engine wrecked on the plane. Um, goes over to talk to the aviation mechanic who set it up and did the wrong thing, who was standing there in tears, um, job over, career over, almost killed a major, you know, executive of the country, um, who turned around and said, you know what, I know you'll never make that mistake again. And to prove it, you're going to work on my personal airplane tomorrow. Um, that's a guy that never forgot again. Could he have screamed? Yeah. Could he have raised Cain? Oh, yeah. Could he have wrecked his life? Given. Um, but criticism wasn't what was required there. Teaching was what was required there. Clarity is what was required there. A willingness to put yourself aside, deal with the needs of that person. We do it all the time with our engineer. Um, I'm almost afraid to say this out loud, but you've heard me say many times, everybody's allowed to make a mistake once. They're just not allowed to make the same one twice. You know, we've had a couple of people that work for me here that have pressed the button at the wrong time or made a mistake or did this or that or the other and caused an outage. Major one before. Um, I could have picked up the phone and there's the voice in the back of my head that wanted me to pick up the phone, yell at the top of my lungs, fire them, whatever, just screaming and all. You could do it so easy. But all I would have done was ruin that person. They would never have been a good engineer again. Our engineers, our people in IT, everyone that works for me has the ability to wreck the universe. Push that button. It go. Start the backup. Launch the application. Everybody's got the ability to bring this place down. You cannot pound them into the ground for a mistake because they'll be too scared to ever try again. Can't do that. You'll ruin a person's long-term career. Um, now, if they make the same mistake again, if they're not paying attention, if they're not working with you, up or out, right? Well, that's the out part. That's when it's time to cut ties, and maybe they'll learn their lesson at their next job. Um, you can't be forever forgiving. But criticism, the, the art of the negative up front, you can't do, not because there's a moral obligation, but because it doesn't work. And a good leader knows, focus on what works. Don't focus on what doesn't. And powerful criticism doesn't. So there's a, a line in the book I love. Any fool can criticize, condemn, and complain, and most fools do. How heavy duty is that? It takes character and self-control to be understanding and forgiving. And as Carlyle said, a great man shows his greatness by the way he treats little men. I've always really detested that form of writing. Uh, little men, great men, all the rest of that nonsense. Um, but let's put it like this. People in the position of authority should not be criticizing the people that aren't. Your job is to teach. Um, so, since no one thinks criticism is justified, ever, and since criticism doesn't work, stop. It's hard. It comes up all the time. The urge to say, what were you thinking? right there at the top of the mind more times in a week than I care to remember. It's embarrassing. Um, but I try very, very hard not to say it. You need to try hard not to say it too. Remember your job. It's clarity, genuine understanding, and the willingness to change. And that will also has to be a willingness to live up to your own standards and not just take things out on people. Criticism itself you need to remove from your vocabulary. Doesn't mean you won't make hard decisions. Doesn't mean you won't make mistakes. Doesn't mean sometimes you don't have to fire people or change things or wreck the universe. But criticism is a fallback, is what you need to stay away from. Now, I sent you a thing called Father Forgets um, very quickly. Uh, it is something um, I read the first time I read uh, Dale Carnegie, and it is uh, powerful. I sent it to your email address. Um, the reason for sending this is twofold. Not because I'm going to get modeling, not because I'm going to read it, not because I'm really going to discuss it much, but I want everybody who sent me a note, and I think I received five or six after last week, um, going, you know, that's empathy. 
You know, being in the box is just talking about empathy. You know, we call it blinders. We call it this. Um, I got quite a few different versions of that. All of them were correct. Um, I call it clarity. That's all. Um, but the point is, and the reason you have this in your inbox, Father, forget, because I wanted to make one simple point. These aren't new concepts. Um, people have known forever that you... You can't be blinded by your own random detrius of thought, by your things coming in and out of your view, by the constant problems that roll on you. You need to see clearly for the people who are important. And in this case, um, W. Livingston Larned realized that he had done his own son wrong, his own very young child, um, not because he was being an unintended father, but because he wasn't seeing him. And that's why I wanted you to read this. He said, I was seeing you as a grown man, not as the boy you are. He had completely lost sight of clarity. Or, you want to call it what it was last time, last time, he was in the box. Or, if you want to talk about what we talked at the beginning and what one of you reminded me of, we just spoke about, he lacked empathy. This need, this concern is endemic to the human nature. It isn't something that's come up recently. It isn't something that came up because the Arbringer Institute decided to write a book or because Dale Carnegie decided to write a book. Empathy in people who want to achieve greatness has always been seen as a requirement. And I think Father Forgets really drives that home if you seriously read it and think about it. And you don't have to get into the hallmark moment of the emotions within it. Just think about what the father is really saying about what his preconceptions versus what reality was and the realization that he could be better than he had been. You realize that at least half of these things that we've talked about each week are all right there within that one simple paper. So, again, I call it clarity. You can call it empathy. This person can call it uh, betraying your own best instincts or being in the box or blinders, or whatever the appropriate term is, at the end of the day, that's what makes you a better person. And to be a better leader, one of the things you should always be working on is making yourself the best you can, so you can help other people live up to their potential. You're never going to achieve it. You're never going to be perfect. It's not a destination. It's a journey. It's something you continue to work on. And do a weekly reset if you need to. All right. That is it for today. Uh, program note, as I mentioned before, because we took two weeks for the previous topic, uh, we've combined the last two. That wasn't that hard, considering the very last one I meant to be very short, just to kind of make that, um, keep your meetings short, routine, um, clear. I'll just spare you that, and we'll make it a full day anyway. Um, so we're going to be talking about leaders who create leaders, development plans, and a lasting culture. Um, please don't miss it, because it is the last one. Um, optional reading, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I'm not going to go through uh, a lot of that other than just mention how it formed an empire and, like all the rest of them, became a little bit cultish. But uh, there are a couple of good things there to, to keep in your pocket. So, again, next week, Lesson 12, Development Plans and Lasting Culture is the last one. Appreciate it very much. Let's see if we have any questions. Anything from the team? Going once, twice, three times. All right. Give you the rest of the time back. Talk to you later. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Very